Thanks for tuning in to Murder Murder News, your true crime news source for missing persons, breaking cases, survivor stories, and cold cases, plus recommendations for the newest TV shows and podcasts. It's finally spring, and we invite you to come hang out in our true crime call as we chat about true crime books and maybe pet our emotional support goats. I'm Aurora. And I'm Angelina. Cults are no fun alone, so don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and tell all of your true crime friends to join the commune at patreon.com slash murder murder news. This is the week in true crime. Murder, murder news. We have a special episode today. We are joined by Will Dean, the author of Tuva Moodyson Mystery Series and, most recently, The Last Thing to Burn. The Last Thing to Burn tells the story of a woman being held captive on a remote farm in the UK. Tandao, or Jane as she is renamed by her captor, was trafficked from her home in Vietnam. After many failed escape attempts, Jane now lives a life of abuse by her captor Len, who has systematically stripped her of her identity over the years, causing her to give up all hope of making it out alive. But now, Jane has discovered she is pregnant and has resolved to protect her child at all costs. This thriller has been compared to books Misery and Room and will 100% keep you on the edge of your seat. We're including a link to purchase the book, which will be on shelves and virtual shelves April 20th in the US. Let's welcome Will Dean to the show, all the way from his wooden house in rural Sweden. So Will, the book is specifically written about a Vietnamese woman who has been trafficked in the UK and held as a prisoner against her will. What was your motivation as a white man from the UK, somebody who of course has a lot of privilege to write this book from the perspective of a marginalized woman who has had all of her power taken away? Why did this feel like the right story for you to tell? That's a great question um, and a really important question. First of all, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, I guess when I, when I come to a story, any story, I'm a very visual writer. So first of all, I see a kind of a scene or a setup. And this story came to me at midnight around five years ago. And I saw just before I was about to go to sleep, I saw in my mind's eye from an aerial perspective of this farm, this Fenland farm in the UK. And I saw a little cottage a tiny cottage at the center. And I saw a woman walking in and out of the cottage and around the cottage. And I came to understand that she couldn't leave this cottage. She wanted to get away, but she could not leave. And I just became fascinated by her story, trying to understand her history and what she was going through on a daily basis. Um, in terms of her being Vietnamese, that's what I saw when I had the initial idea. So she came to me probably kind of from my subconscious. But then I did wrestle with this idea for a long time. Like, do I have the right to tell this story? Do I have the right to, to tell a story that's not my own experience? And I think it's a really complicated and important question to ask. I really do. And you're right, I have tons of privilege. And I think my kind of general feeling having written now like six or seven different books is that if you're going to write kind of through your whole career and you want to tell stories at some point you're going to have to write outside of your experience but then you have to do that in the right way you have to do that with a huge amount of empathy and sensitivity you have to do your research you have to write kind of from a place of love and you have to do your character justice and I, I just kind of spent a long time, I spent five years on this book and I just spent a long time trying to do my main character justice. That's what I wanted out of this book is to try and tell her story in an empathetic way, in a, in a, in a true way, or as much as I possibly could. And then kind of hand it over to the world. And if the world judged it to be lacking in some way, then I would take that on the chin and learn from it or try to learn from it. And I think as a writer, that's what I try and do with every book is try and try and move forward and try and learn and try and improve my craft and try and be more empathetic and, and do my characters justice. So I think it's it is a really important um, kind of point. It really is. I think, you know, years ago, people just kind of wrote what they want willy nilly without doing any research. And True. that can do a lot of genuine harm. So I, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I took it very seriously. Like, for example, um, I have Vietnamese family members, my sister-in-law, my niece, my nephew, they all live in Vietnam. So I talked at length with them 
Um, a friend of mine is half Vietnamese. She read a very early draft. Another friend is kind of involved in, in a way with uh, counseling of victims of trafficking. So I talked to her, she read an early draft and that kind of thing. So I wanted to get feedback and I wanted to try and just do my very, very best. That's awesome. That's very, uh, very thorough uh, consulting and, and research on that, which is commendable, but wow, five years is <laughs> a long time to spend on that. <laughs> um, just one second, sorry, I have to uh, press something before I do it mid talk. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. What was your process like for getting into the mindset of uh, the woman who Len calls Jane, who's a woman being held against her will, afraid of losing her life, and is even more afraid of her sister, who she uh, traveled with, being deported back to Vietnam? Um, what was your research process like? You spoke a little bit about that, but uh, where did you turn to get the info you needed about things like human trafficking, immigrants' perspective of England? Okay, so for, for, for a lot of that research, that kind of practical level research about what that journey may have been like and what some of those experiences may have felt like, I just, I went to as many sources as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. And that included things like reports and interviews from NGOs and charities, but also first-hand accounts of certain experiences. It might not have been specifically a trafficking experience. It might have been someone who, who survived some kind of domestic control situation which right. I think is absolutely like horrific and terrifying and, and just trying to understand some of those feelings mm -hmm. really. And then leveraging that research, I just spent a long time thinking. I think this is kind of a undervalued part of the writing process often, you know, if writers are expected to write a book a year, it doesn't give you that much time to think and to, and to try and put yourself in someone else's shoes, which is what write, good writing I think always is, is trying to, uh, recreate a certain experience even though it's fictional and make it feel authentic to the reader mm -hmm. so that we can all understand something about being human and that's what I did I did the research and then I did a lot of thinking and mm -hmm. and just kind of letting my imagination wander and trying to understand what this situation would be like yeah, that, that is a really crucial part of the uh, um, writing experience. I was, it's funny, I was just discussing this with my partner yesterday, who's a musician, who was talking about songwriting. And he was like, I feel kind of weird, you know, putting a, a dollar value on my time when like most of the actual work that I'm doing is sitting and thinking. And it, like, it, right. it's hard to quantify that, but it's like, that's a really important part of the process. Without that, you have nothing, you know? 100%, that's really interesting to hear his perspective on that. And it's so true, like we are expected to kind of churn out material. And to yeah. some extent, if we want to make a living, we have to do that. But I think sometimes you just, with some projects, I'll write them in a year and some like this, I just needed more time yeah. to breathe and for me to learn and for me to kind of make sure I, I, I did it in the right way that I would be happy with in 10 years time when I look back. So yeah, I think that thinking time and that kind of daydreaming time is important. Right, yeah. Right. Well, and that really shows like the, the time and the thought you put into it absolutely shows because what you came up with is this wonderfully intense book. And it's easy to kind of make the comparison uh, between this to Stephen King's Misery. Others have compared it to Room by Emma Donahue. What were your sources of inspiration for weaving such a fantastic thriller? Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm so I'm always delighted to hear those comparisons because I love those two authors. I think they're brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I, the, I started off with that visual of these two characters. The whole book is really mainly about two characters who are living in this very isolated location. And I zoomed out in my mind's eye and I saw just how isolated they were. This tiny two, two rooms upstairs, two rooms downstairs farmhouse. And in contrast to Room and Misery, both, I, I really admire both of those books, our main character can always see out. She can always see long distances because of how flat the landscape is. Right. And I thought that was kind of extra awful in a way, the fact that she can see traffic and she can see churches and villages yeah. and people living normal lives who have agency, who are able to maintain their identity and, and they have kind of control over their day-to-day -day existence. And she sees all that in the distance and she can never quite reach it. And I just kind of felt that in a visceral way how awful that must be yeah absolutely um 
So there were a few times when privilege was addressed from the viewpoint of uh, Jane or Tan Dao. Um, she mentioned that uh, no one would put up posters looking for her. She wouldn't be talked about on the news. And at one point even expressed that folks like Len had more regard for a pig's feelings than her own. Is this something that you've drawn from attitudes that you've seen in real life and maybe how the media typically handles cases involving people of color and immigrants? It is actually, and I've written about it uh, in another book, in a series set in Sweden, the same thing, because I'm always really shocked. <laughs> well, not shocked, but appalled. I'm not yeah. shocked. That's the yeah. that's in a way the worst thing is I'm not shocked. Absolutely. The way that the way that sometimes you'll you'll see someone go missing, uh, and there will be really nothing in the media about it, and then the next week someone else will go missing who happens to be white, and it's everywhere. Yeah. And and there's so much more noise, and it just it's it's a uh, horrendous reality of the world we're living in and I think that fiction should reflect the world that we're living in so that we can kind of interrogate it and, and think about things right and and I do find Len's attitude to her and everything else just abhorrent you know I think he's the worst character I will ever write <laughs> I absolutely yeah. loathe him and yeah. and yeah the way that he systematically kind of works to erode her identity by burning her last few possessions and kind of asking her to choose which one should be right. burnt is horrific. And the way that he completely disregards or places no value on her language and on right. her culture right. and on her food. It's just, yeah, it's just, a, he's a terrible person. Yeah, he's the worst. And in reading it, it kind of made me think about um, there's so much talk now, fortunately, about like nice men, like for women. Mm. And from an outward perspective, he has this persona of being probably a nice guy, like to his friends, like they all probably think that, you know, like he just takes care of his pigs and he's kind to people and he's just a like simple his neighbors. Guy. Yeah, <laughs> just like he's just a friendly neighbor that doesn't interfere with your business and that sort of thing. And um, you know, there's like some obvious like abusive things like physical abuse and such, but so much of it is mental, like you just mentioned with stripping away mm -hmm. her culture. And um, I'm glad we're finally talking about that because I don't think that mental abuse of that nature was considered as bad as physical abuse for a long time, but they, they both do so much damage and really do erode our, somebody's personality. So mm -hmm. I thought that was very well done um, in making him a villain in such a great but subtle way. Right. Thank you. It was really important to me that that it wasn't kind of too sensationalized, that some of it was relatable on a very domestic setting. And the fact that, you know, right now, all around the world, there are homes, there are apartments and, and houses where someone is controlling the other person. Absolutely. And that other person is just, yeah, it, it's just, it's, and it can go on for years. And in this book, mm -hmm. it goes on for years. And I was actually mm -hmm. asked by, by various people through the editorial process, is this too long? Is this, is this too long of an experience to endure? And actually in real life, like this happens throughout long marriages and things. And it's totally, I, I wanted it to seem like, you know, or, or to feel like it's something that she, she's enduring and she has immense strength and resilience to manage through that, but it does go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And it is a kind of a hidden crime that's happening. Right. Yeah, especially with, uh, you know, neighbors even stopping by or people being conscious of that someone's living there, but just assuming, oh, it's, you know, his wife, <laughs> it's whatever. Right. But I'm sure that goes on a lot. Right. Well, this is very much a horror story, but your writing is descriptive without ever delving into the realm of exploitation and gore. Do you typically prefer to create scares with subtlety in your work? Or was it the subject matter of this novel made it too uncomfortable to reveal and describe all the details of what Jane uh, Sustundal endures? I think that's something that I have in, that, that runs through all of my work and will always run through my work. I don't like writing violence or gore. I just don't find it very interesting and I find it difficult to write that. I'm just not interested in it. I'm interested in the human impact of things and mm -hmm. the kind of the ripples that a certain act or a certain event can have through a community, through a relationship, through, through one individual person. That's mm -hmm. what I'm fascinated by, not an act of violence. So I, I tend to keep that off the page as much as I possibly can. And in terms of what I love to read and the books that I, I, I devour and I reread, it's I like tension. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that has a, has a kind of a power all of its own. You don't really need graphic violence if you have that kind of edge of your seat sense of discomfort. And if you're really invested in a character, if you, if you kind of start to love a character or really care about a character, that creates all the tension you need. You don't need all of that violence, in my opinion. Yeah, it, I feel like it can be scarier. And as someone who, like, I've been very interested in horror, um, both in like movies and in reading uh, in my life. And I went through periods where I was really into gory stuff. And now reflecting on it, I'm like, you know, it does seem kind of senseless. And reading something more like uh, The Last Thing to Burn, I'm like, this feel, it feels scarier at points because there's so much left unsaid and it does create that tension, which is, uh, you know, so creepy. <laughs> and I think if I, if I tried to write something that was really obviously gratuitously violent, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to write it, first of all. And I only right. really write what I want to write. And also it would just be like quite an empty emotion. It's quite a shallow emotion whereas something that's tense like I was tense writing this book right. and I'm not normally particularly tense writing but I, I had a knot in my stomach because I was worried about our main character all the way through the book and every time I reread it and worked on it over those years I had that knot in my stomach again and I was emotional when I finished writing the book which sounds kind of strange but it's it's true it's that it's that tension and that care for a, for a person for a character Wow, I think it creates that in your readers too, because I, I I felt some of that when I was going through it, but when I was reading it. But, yeah, um, I think I think that's sort of the motivation sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Like to finish a book or get through it, because uh, like I'd mentioned when we were talking before, um, I I did end up reading it in just a couple of days, and I think I just couldn't take it. Like I had mm -hmm. to have a, had to have. A it's no things are going to be okay or not okay or whatever. Um, so I can't you just imagine. want to get to the resolution. <laughs> yeah. And it's like to be <laughs> to exist in that place on and off for five years while mm -hmm. you know, wrote this, like, God, that must have been exhausting. Was that exhausting? <laughs> yeah, it was, it wasn't exhausting. I don't know. It was just very intense, very mm -hmm. emotional. I just felt very strongly that I wanted this person to be okay and I wanted yeah. Len to not be okay and I wanted right. him to face some degree of justice some yes. degree of consequence for his actions right. which is that's a nice thing about writing fiction is you know in the real world often these these bad people they don't face the consequences of, the, of what they've done and I can I can make that happen which is satisfying for me as a writer and hopefully for readers as well. Absolutely. But I do get a lot of letters and emails right now from readers reading early versions of the book. And I, and often they say they read it very, very quickly and it's very mm. dis disturbing and it's late, a late night read and they yeah. have ruined the next day for them. And I kind of feel like I need to thank them for that, but also apologize for ruining, it, <laughs> ruining their sleep. <laughs> well once they get through it I feel like you know yeah just the feeling of finishing a, a novel like that is uh, <laughs> cathartic <laughs> absolutely <laughs> um so Len was uh brutish and not particularly bright um was it a deliberate move to contrast uh Tandao's expectations of England and British people um when I think of human trafficking and the kind of person that comes to mind as a captor I think of folks like Jeffrey Epstein and his rich, powerful associates. Do you think in reality, the majority of these villains are more, li more likely to resemble Len or Epstein? Oh, that's a really interesting and difficult question to answer. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know. I think there's a mixture, you know, it's probably like every other, every other kind of group of people, there's, there's, a, there's a real range. I think with Len, he's, he is very basic on one level. Mm -hmm. I'm very kind of stuck in an idea of uh, manhood and of, of marriage from, from many decades ago. Right. But at the same time, he's quite sophisticated and cunning in some ways, the way he covers mm -hmm. things up and the way he kind of installs cameras in all of the rooms to monitor True. our main character's movements and things like that. So, yeah, he is a brute and he's quite a faceless character for me. I don't really see yeah. his face. I just kind of see him as a huge kind of looming presence in the house, the same way as I see his late mother as a kind of, existing right. presence in this house but but uh yeah he 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 is utterly vile and so is epstein they're all vile you know yeah. if they're intelligent and sophisticated or well-dressed or whatever it doesn't matter they're all right. utterly vile mm. they're all the same gross creature inside <laughs> yeah mm. Absolutely. Well, you just mentioned a character that I found to be particularly interesting. She never actually makes an appearance in the book, but she's still sort of 
omnipresent and that is Len's mother. So he mentions to Jane that she never needed things like medical care or pain meds and is always kind of making her the point of comparison about how Jane isn't as good as her or isn't living as simply as her. And she basically, to me, sounded like kind of a monster the way that Len described her. Did you kind of see her as being a monster or maybe was there an element of her being abused and sort of trapped and perhaps this was just because she was poor and stuck in this environment? And um, as an addition to that, can you imagine who she is? And can you pick somebody that you would want her to be cast as if this were made into a movie? <laughs> wow, that's interesting. She, she is a really strong presence for me in this house. She's almost like a, a haunting figure in, in this house. Um, mm -hmm. And she definitely does drive a lot of Len's views and his, his processes, his decision-making processes. But I can't really, I don't feel that she's evil in the same way as Len is. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, but I don't get that sense. I think maybe she was, maybe she found it challenging when she brought him up. Maybe there, there was not a lot of time. There's not a lot of money. There was not a lot of help. Mm -hmm. I think it's more that he has created himself as the monster and he has just leveraged a lot of the things that she did just to survive perhaps in a time that we don't live in anymore, where there are no conveniences and so on. So she, he kind of still expects our main character in this book to live that life that really mm -hmm. is his mother's life from two generations before. Mm -hmm. But having said that, I can't, I don't know her that well. And I am afraid of her. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not really I'm afraid sure. of her. <laughs> yeah. And in, in terms of uh, casting, I'm talking to people right now about this. So that's a very pertinent question. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm not very good at, uh, I don't describe my characters physically that much, like especially right. with our main character in this book, I see the world through her eyes. So I don't really right. have a strong image of what she looks like. Same with Len, he's quite faceless. I'm not so interested in that, ang that part of things. So with his mother, I don't know how they would film that. Maybe it would be flashbacks and she would be kind of in the shadows as well or something like that. And, but I think she's a strong person. Mm -hmm. whether that's for good or for or for bad wow um when you kind of mentioned um that you feel like you can't describe uh len and he just sort of feels like a presence in the house as well just like his mother um i just sort of thought wow that'd be interesting to do from a film perspective as well where like you don't actually see the guy but he's still like the killer or the creepy you know the, the bad character character <laughs> but Absolutely. Um, it's kind of like it's kind of like that Jaws dynamic of you don't see the shark that much, but you yeah. hear the music, you see like, something in the water. And with Len, right. yeah, like if 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 a viewer heard the quad bike coming or heard his footsteps, his footsteps are very a very, very, very like anxiety inducing for me. Yeah. The sound of his footsteps up the stairs and things like that. Yeah, it's and just those horrific. headlights and just like if you you heard as a uh, talking from the other room or something, you wouldn't even need to see his face to be scared, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so our next question, uh, maybe you hadn't, uh, maybe you don't have an answer for this either. It's kind of in the same realm, but uh, like if you thought about who you might cast for uh, Tandao or um, for Len. Uh, again, I've been having these conversations in the last week yeah. with, with <laughs> Tandao. It needs to be a Vietnamese actor. Yeah. And that's, that's the only real thing that I'm very adamant about. Yeah. And from, I can't talk too much about this, but from the people I've been talking to, they would love to kind of travel there and cast someone. And that's, wow, that would that's be wonderful. Great. Yeah, yeah. That'd be awesome. And in terms, in terms of um, how that uh, person looks, like I say, I don't really mind. It's just, I guess it's just ha having that, that sense of being that character, but I don't know how that works with being an actor with Len I don't know either like it, it needs to be someone quite physically imposing I guess mm -hmm. otherwise it wouldn't really work but um I think acting is all about the actual acting so I'm I'm not so I'm not so sure what they need to look like cool that's interesting and I I was trying to like cast it myself I love this game it's one of my favorites and so I was looking up Vietnamese actresses like in a at least like an English speaking sort of world um, and there's just not many, which I think is no, terrible. There really isn't. 
Like I was at, like, I found an article that had um, like a few, but I had seen them in so few things and they weren't in sort of big name productions. So that definitely needs to change. But somebody I was gonna throw out there that I think is just wonderful is uh, Lana Condor, who's Jubilee in X-Men. She's also into All the Boys I've Loved Before, which is great on Netflix. And she's hey. just, a, she's Vietnamese and I love her. <laughs> <laughs> so Sounds like a great fit. <laughs> anybody out there casting, listening. <laughs> I've yeah. solved problem. You, you might get a you might get a credit now on the, uh, <laughs> on the titles. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> have you thought about writing a sequel, or would you think what would you think would have happened to Baby Hong after the epilogue? That's interesting. I I I don't think I will ever write a sequel to this novel. I think I kind of feel like I want to leave them to it now to live their wow. life. Mm -hmm. You know, nice. I, I want that that baby who was brought up in this horrific place to just go and live her life and have a lot of joy and happiness and and for her never to experience anything like that again. And and yeah, I kind of want to leave them to it. I mean, that might sound strange, but that's how I feel. I want I, it's not my business anymore. I want them to go and live their life now. Wow. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Will, and uh, everyone be sure to check out The Last Thing to Burn, which will be available in North America on April 20th. Thanks so thank much. you so much for having me. It's been, it's been great talking to you both. Great questions. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for tuning into This Week in True Crime with Murder Murder News. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button below, give us a thumbs up, and tell all of your true crime friends. Help support Murder Murder News by signing up for our commune at murdermurder.news, and your $5 a month sponsorship helps us keep the true crime lights on. It helps us produce our weekly show and help support our amazing writers that keep you up to date with the latest breaking news every day on murdermurder.news. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. See you next week.